the Wizard of Britain. Elusive and mysterious, he was said to have guided Arthur, the greatest legendary king of all time. But who was Merlin? And did he really exist at all? Legend offers three Merlins in life and many mysteries surrounding his death. But perhaps that's just what Merlin would have wanted. The traditional tale of Merlin begins in the 5th century. Under siege, the British High King fled to the Welsh mountains to build a fortress. But every night, the stone walls were shaken to the ground. The king's advisers declared that a fatherless boy must be sacrificed. The king's scouts searched until they came upon some children at play. But one child was shunned by the rest because they said he had no father. His mother confirmed that a strange demonic spirit had possessed her in the night. So the fatherless lad was bundled off to the fallen fortress. But as the sacrificial priest approached, the boy broke free and challenged the king saying that he alone knew why the walls would not stand. For this was the young Merlin, and he had the sight. He said, Dig here, and you will find an underground pool. Drain that pool, and you will find two stone jars. The High King ordered his men to dig, and soon, as Merlin predicted, they found a pool and two jars. Suddenly, the jars cracked open, and out flew two dragons, one red and one white. They rose into the air, breathing fire, grappling with each other, and racing back and forth across the sky. At last, the mighty red dragon chased the white dragon over the horizon and out of view. The king shuddered. Then the young Merlin spoke his first great prophecy. The red dragon is the people of Britain. They will be chased by the white dragon, the invaders, until a great king appears who will unite the British and bring peace to this troubled land. From that moment, Merlin knew it was his mission to bring about the rise of this king. In the years that followed, Merlin rapidly grew into his full powers. Legend has it that during this time, he was called upon to build a great monument commemorating a massacre of British chiefs. It is said he used his magical horn and other occult arts to transport huge stones across the sea from a rock monument in Ireland. he arranged in the great circle known today as Stonehenge. Later, a besotted British king asked Merlin to cast a spell so that he could lie with another man's wife. The enchanter agreed, asking in return for the child he knew would be born of that tryst. The son was called Arthur, and Merlin took him to be raised safely in the Welsh countryside. Soon, Arthur's father died, and the kingdom fell into chaos as many nobles vied for the crown. So Merlin devised a test. 
Magically ramming a sword into a great stone, he decreed that only the man destined to be king could draw it out again. Many knights tried, but none succeeded. Then, when Arthur was 15, Merlin knew it was time for his true identity to be revealed. The young Arthur easily drew the sword from the stone and was proclaimed king. There followed 20 legendary years of peace for Arthur, his courageous and gallant knights, and all his kingdom. This was the golden age of Camelot. In those golden years, Merlin was Arthur's mentor, prophet, and sage. Only once did Arthur ignore the advice of his wise friend, when he took Guinevere for his wife despite Merlin's warnings that she would betray him. It was Merlin who designed Guinevere's dowry, a great round table where all of Arthur's knights could be equal. Merlin predicted that the knights of the round table would bring untold honor and marvels to the kingdom. But Merlin was no lover of the pomp and pageantry at Arthur's court. He often disappeared into the forest to commune with the natural world. There he was free to exercise his powers as a shapeshifter, taking on the forms of birds and animals. As for Merlin's end, it is as mysterious as his birth. Some say he did not die, but just disappeared one last time, trapped by a beautiful nymph inside a hawthorn tree. That is the legend. And for centuries, the specter of Merlin has haunted Britain. But was there ever a real wizard of the British Isles? A supernatural force harnessed by... Our search for the real Merlin begins in the 12th century, when Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote his History of the Kings of Britain. In it, we first hear of Merlin as mentor and prophet to King Arthur. About Merlin, Geoffrey wrote, All were amazed at his knowledge and knew there was something supernatural about him. There was no one else in the kingdom with greater skill in foretelling the future. Though Geoffrey claimed to be writing history, much of his book was based on legends passed on by storytellers, or was his own invention. But the legends often contained a kernel of truth. So was there ever a real Merlin? Certainly, places mentioned by Geoffrey of Monmouth do exist and are even named after Merlin. Caerferden, Welsh for the city of Merlin, is the town in South Wales where the fatherless boy Merlin of legend was supposedly found by the King's scouts. Dinas Imrus is the hill in the heart of Snowdonia, where legend tells of dragons emerging from the hidden pool. And to this day, a curious pool lies hidden at the top of the hill. Still, too, the red dragon is the emblem of Wales, one of the last bastions of the original Britons. And in Cornwall at Tintagel, where Merlin is said to have arranged the conception of Arthur, there is an awesome tunnel, pounded by the sea and still known as Merlin's Cave. Fourteen years after producing the history of the kings of Britain, Geoffrey of Monmouth wrote a second book, The Life of Merlin. Here, Merlin emerges in a different light. Here, perhaps, is the real historical Merlin.
This Merlin belongs not to Wales or Cornwall, but to the Scottish borders. Here he is not the bard and prophet of Arthur, but of Gwendolai, the last pagan king of Scotland. In a fierce and bloody battle, Gwendolai fought with one of the first Christian kings. This was the Battle of Arderith. It took place in 573 AD on the Scottish border. It was a turning point in British history, for the pagan army was routed. Gwendolai and Merlin's three brothers were slain. It was the end of the pagan way of life. Merlin's grief was so great that, according to Geoffrey, he did not cease to pour out laments, but strewed dust on his hair, rent his garments, and prostrated himself on the ground. Then he departed secretly to the woods, where he lived on roots, grasses, and fruits of the thicket. Hidden like a wild animal, he remained, forgetful of himself and his kindred. Historical annals from the time support Geoffrey by confirming that the Battle of Arderith did take place. One of these concludes, Gwendolai fell, and Merlin became mad. Here, then, is the first thread of historical evidence, confirming the existence of a Merlin character in the dark ages of British history. He does seem to have been a real person, a poet who, who was supposed to have prophetic gifts and wandered about wildly in the south of Scotland uttering prophecies. Now, he would be too late to be associated with Arthur. The one who is associated with Arthur is a more doubtful figure. There is certainly a real Merlin or Merthen in the late sixth century. Laments and poems attributed to this Merlin have survived in early Welsh literature, giving even more support to Geoffrey of Monmouth's account. There is also a description in the life of St. Samson of Christian saints traveling deep into the woods of the Scottish borders to find a soothsayer whose prophecies were said to be exceptionally accurate. Could this have been Merlin? And in the life of St. Kentigern, the saint is said to have sought out Merlin in his forest exile to calm his troubled mind. So, from three different sources, and from the poet's own writings, we get a consistent picture of a Merlin driven mad by grief, living in the forest, prophesying and communing with animals, lamenting the downfall of the pagan way of life. But it was a way of life with special significance in Britain at the time. It recalls the ancient Druids, the mysterious high priests of the Celtic peoples who ruled Britain before the coming of the Romans. Could Merlin have been the last of the Druids? The historical Merlin seems at one point to have been living like a Druid. The Druids were the powerful, mysterious priests of the Celtic peoples who had lived in Britain for hundreds of years before the Roman invasion of 43 AD. They literally contained the knowledge of the people because their training was done entirely orally, nothing was ever written, and it entailed an enormous amount of memory work. And so each Druid, by the end of his training, was literally a, a walking library of all the mythology, the knowledge, the history of the Celtic people. The Romans knew they would have to destroy this priestly cult if their conquest of Britain were to succeed, for the Druids were the main force behind the Celtic resistance. The Romans did, in fact, almost wipe out the Druids. 
Their loss of life was bad enough, but the destruction of their sacred groves of ancient oak trees was far worse. Druids believed each rock and tree had a living spirit. Priests were thought to know the languages of the animals and have the power to command them. Wolves, deer, ravens and swans had a sacred significance to the druids. Could Merlin have been part of a druidic revival in the years after the Romans left Britain in the 5th century? Certainly in his forest years, he was living very much like a druid. Surviving poems by Merlin show him communicating with various cult animals of the Celts. In one poem, he laments his plight to a tame wolf. And in one of Geoffrey's stories, Merlin rides on a stag with deer gathered round, like the druidic shaman Kernonos, Lord of the Beasts. The druids were also well known as prophets, seeing into the future, foretelling victories and disasters, predicting the destiny of a child yet to be born, and specifying how a person would die. All the stories of Merlin describe him as a prophet too. His most famous prophecy was of Arthur's destiny. In the same proclamation, written down by Geoffrey of Monmouth, Merlin went on to say, Men will get drunk on wine and forget heaven in favor of earth. The stars will turn away. Crops will wither and water will disappear from the earth. Roots will turn into branches and branches will turn into roots. Soon, everything will cease to accomplish its function. The sun rays shock will lift up the seas and the dust of ancient times will rise up again. So the Merlin of the 6th century, who after the death of his lord retreated to the wild forest, communed with birds and beasts, and who spoke inspired prophecy, this Merlin was living very much like a druid. In many ways it's quite clear, I think, uh, that he is, was originally a druid. And one of the fascinating things about the, the legend as it's come down to us through Geoffrey and the Welsh poetry is that they clearly were quite unconscious of what they were describing and described many archaic practices without knowing their meaning, which of course this is a strong confirmation that they're authentic. Later writers could not have invented realistic descriptions of druidic practices. They must have been reporting accounts handed down over centuries. And yet, Merlin had been high priest to Gwendolai before reverting to a druid's life in the forest. Here are found even more mystical insights into the wizard of Britain. Before he went mad and retreated into the forest, the historical Merlin was advisor and high priest to Gwendolai, pagan king of the north. And that would have meant he was his household poet, had a very a particular relationship between poet and king. It was the poet, for example, who sanctified the king at his accession, who gave him a white wand which signified his right to rule, who praised the king and ensured his immortality and his praise poems. As high priest, Merlin's most important role would have been to personify Lug, the brightest of the Celtic gods. He was a sort of youthful saviour god, or I would say a sort of Christ figure, really, who was regarded, among other things, as the ancestor and protector of the monarchy. And every king was believed actually to be a son of Lug, that whilst, of course, they knew that the previous king presumably had produced an heir by his wife, that nevertheless it was the god Lug who had, um, in the night, impregnated the queen. According to early Welsh and Irish literature, at the inauguration of a new king, the high priest represented the spirit of Lug, 
and conducted age-old rituals to sanctify the new monarch. Probably the ceremony took place at a sacred stone circle, like this one at Avebury in England, symbolically wedding the king to the land and ensuring the future well-being of the kingdom. It could be that the historical Merlin performed this high priest role for Gwendolai. Here is a glimpse of the eternal Merlin, the priest who was reincarnated every generation, the ever-returning spiritual wise man. This same Merlin, after the death of his lord, went mad with grief and retreated to the forest where he lived like a druidic shaman, at one with the dark, wild, ancient world of unbridled nature. So, from the life of one extraordinary poet and prophet, history and legend have given us many Merlins a druid priest. The god Lug. A wise man and spiritual mentor. Geoffrey of Monmouth must have taken a folk memory of this remarkable individual whose story had been told for several centuries and embellished it to fit with the grand scheme of his book and his times. He knew the traditions of Merlin he knew the traditions of Merlin's poems and prophecies, but he developed them so much himself. I mean, he blew up these prophecies into several pages. It's very difficult to sort out anything behind it, except that he knew something about a real Merlin. Geoffrey transplanted Merlin and Arthur from the Dark Ages and reshaped them for his medieval audience in 12th century Britain. Merlin became Arthur's mentor wizard, soothsayer, and enchanter. And so the historical Merlin became overlaid by this more magical, mythical figure. Since Geoffrey, many others have continued the work. There is a curious twist at the end of this story. For the truth seems to be that Merlin was party to the final defeat of the pagan British Celts. But in legend, he has been turned into their savior, responsible for ushering in the golden age of Arthur. Perhaps that's what happens when history is turned into legend, when hopes and dreams are stronger than the actual truth. But what did happen to Merlin in the end? In the legends, at least, he didn't die, but withdrew from the world, his death as mysterious as his entire life. In some tales, a nymph so captivated him that he showed her how to imprison a man without a tower or walls. Some say she trapped him under a stone. Others, that a hawthorn tree enclosed him. It is also said he took the miraculous treasures of Britain to the glass house. This, some believe, is Bardsey Island, a sacred isle in North Wales. Others say the House of Glass is Glastonbury in Somerset. Or might it be that the House of Glass is the island of Britain itself, surrounded by the transparent walls of the sea, forever Merlin's sacred enclosure? For remember that the first name this island bore before it was taken or settled was Class Miradin, Merlin's precinct. Could this mean that the spirit of Merlin lives on and can still be sensed in the wild, natural places of the British Isles. Did the last of the Druids retreat underground with the coming of the Christian world? Is Merlin waiting to return, as some believe, waiting to take his place as the spiritual leader of the British people? One thing is certain. As long as people hunger for wisdom, poetry and enchantment, the Merlin of myth will never die. As to the rest, only time will tell.
Tomorrow at the same time, America's Century uncovers the riots, protest and anger that reigned as the Vietnam War raged on and looks at how rights activists became increasingly strident. of Britain. Elusive and mysterious, he was said to have guided Arthur, the greatest legendary king of all time. But who was Merlin, and did he really exist at all? Legend offers three Merlins in life, and many mysteries surrounding his death. But perhaps that's just what Merlin would have wanted. The traditional tale of Merlin begins in the 5th century. Under siege, the British High King fled to the Welsh mountains to build a fortress. But every night, the stone walls were shaken to the ground. The High King ordered his men to dig, and soon, as Merlin predicted, they found a pool and two jars. Suddenly, the jars cracked open, and out flew two dragons, one red and one white. They rose into the air, breathing fire, grappling with each other, and racing back and forth across the sky. At last, the mighty red dragon chased the white dragon over the horizon. The king's advisers declared that a fatherless boy must be sacrificed. The king's scouts searched until they came upon some children at play. But one child was shunned by the rest, because they said he had no father. His mother confirmed that a strange demonic spirit had possessed her in the night. So the fatherless lad was bundled off to the fallen fortress. But as the sacrificial priest approached, the boy broke free and challenged the king saying that he alone knew why the walls would not stand. For this was the young Merlin, and he had the sight. He said, Dig here, and you will find an underground pool. Drain that pool, and you will find two stone jars. <laughs> 